Hello, this is Haku Debin, and I'm here to read to you SCP-41, 42, 43, 44, and 45. Starting with SCP-41, the Thought Broadcasting Patient. Item number, SCP-41. Object class, safe. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-41 is to be hospitalized at Bioresearch Area 12. The not catter class, should SCP-41's abilities ever propagate beyond a reasonably containable area, the risk of SCP's sensitive information being broadcast to the public remains too great of risk and warrants area-level isolation away from the general populace. SCP-41 personnel wanting to keep their thoughts private are advised to remain outside of a 15-meter radius from SCP-41, beyond the designated red circle on the floor. It is beneficial to the mental health of SCP-41 to have a sitter in the room who watches television and concentrates on its programming. This allows SCP-41 to effectively watch television through the mind of someone else. The optimal sitter is a D-class personnel with below average intelligence, whose mind does not wander or have more than one train of thought at a time. Though not mind control, SCP-41 if 41 has used its abilities, coerce the editors into watching programming that they don't, don't enjoy, they themselves enjoy. SCP-41's taste vary between gore slash slasher films. I haven't even expressed interest in snuff and children's programming. Very odd. SCP-41 is a male human suffering from irreversible damage to his central nervous system, which is believed to have been caused by an infection of a rare strain of bacteria meningitis. Although antibiotics were successful in clearing the infection, the membranes surrounding his brain and spinal cord had reacted to the infection by severing many neurons connected to the central nervous system to the rest of, it, of the body. SCP-41 must rely on a respirator to sustain his breathing, a biventricular pacemaker to keep his heart beating, and a nasogastric tube to provide nutrition. Visually, SCP-41 appears to be in, in a persistent vegetative state. However, observers in the presence of SCP-41 begin to realize that their thoughts, along with everyone else's in about a 10 meter radius from SCP-41 are broadcast in a semi-audible fashion. Aside from being the source, SCP-41 is also capable of broadcasting his own thoughts to those present. In performing an idea using words will have those, those thoughts unwillingly transmitted to others in its range as mind-audible speech, which cannot be recorded by any known equipment. Correction, see Addendum 1. Mind-audible speech may be heard using whatever a subject chooses to think with. Most likely, this is the subject's normal voice. See Document 1. Visual thoughts and images are broadcast as well, but, not, but are not received as readily. The images are most effectively transmitted when both the sender and receiver have their eyes closed. The sender concentrates on a single object without environment or background, and the receiver's mind is clear of conscious thoughts, communication between subjects using visual images, particularly those not rooted in memory, but in imagination is usually difficult. The sender typically has a struggle conceiving a highly detailed mental object from a single point of view, but a receiver will often try to fill in gaps of missing information, ultimately resulting in the receiver seeing a different image from what was sent. The most difficult the imagery to be successfully broadcast appears to be a person's face, particularly if the one is, if the image is one of a person in motion. Although able to transmit his thoughts to others, SP41 is not very talkative. Attempts to present or SCP-41 to divulge any information about his abilities have been so far fruitless. SP-41 is typically silent and normally will not respond to any direct attempts at communication. However, SP-41 appears to have a sense of humor as he interjects occasional comments into conversations of others.
Well, researcher Bob was taking voice notes from a digital audio recorder. A fellow researcher was changing the television in SCP-41's room. While the television was on a channel of static disembodied voices, this could be f heard filtered through the white noise. According to Eckerd, mind audible with speech with white noise generator sent. Sound recording equipment have begun to yield honest results. The most audio is garbled, and the recording it sounds may or not be voices that are widely left toward individual interpretations. Addendum 2 It has come to my attention that several old personnel have, have used SCP-041 as an ad hoc, like, she likes me, she likes me not detector. This is one of the most appalling things I've ever heard. Are we safeguarding potentially world destroying objects, or are we in third grade? Dr. Klein. Document 1. Researcher's quote. You know, the first time I was in that room with Kent in 41, I kept hearing the singing. It was this little girl's voice singing some kid's song. It wasn't a TV, and it definitely wasn't a radio. It was in our heads, you know, so I think, you know, if I was stuck in bed without anything else to do, I'd sing like a little girl too. And then this voice comes into my head, and, hey, it's not me. I don't know that tune. And then old Ken looks me gone all white in the face. You know? No, this event occurred after SP-239 was placed in a comedically in this coma. The connection between the two SCPs is currently unconfirmed. Moving on, we are going to SCP-042, a formerly winged horse. Item number 42, Object Class Safe. SV-42 is currently housed within minimum security ad hoc 12 at Bio Research Area 32. Despite SCP-42 seeming in this inclination to attempt escape at this point, security measures must still be maintained at all times. Previous attempts to maintain the health of the ground uncovered in ad hoc 12 have failed to date. Despite regular watering, SCP-42's presence leaves the ground parched wherever it treads, as it has not not begun and determined what happens to either water, the program of watering has been discontinued as unnecessary and potentially hazardous to the local water table. Monitoring of local well levels and something of the area's water is to be carried out on a weekly basis. Personnel interacting with SCP-042, SCP including any handlers, medical personnel, feeders, and consultable staff, must submit to a thorough searching, including data redacted. Prior to entrance into Paddock 12, any personnel attempting to smuggle a weapon or an object which can be used as a weapon is to be immediately redacted. Personnel to undergo psychological screening once per week after interacting in any way with SV-42. Medical personnel examining the wounds on SV-42's back are to be clearly mar closely monitored at all times, lest they attempt to euthanize SCP-42. Description SCP-42 is an animal believed to be a member of the genus Equus. Its coat is white in color, with some small brown spotting. It stands at 183 centimeters. 18 hands? That's not a measurement that I know of. Anyway, to its withers and it weighs uh, 710 kilograms. Its weight has dropped significantly since it has been in invest. Foundation custody due to both atrophy from lack of physical act activity and refusal to eat. The liquid nutrient that I forcefully administered keeps it alive but remains em emaciated and weak. SCP 42 exhibits two light brown protrusions from its back linked to powerful musculature, now atrophied, throughout its back. These bones end at 37 centimeters from the surface of its back 
and they protrude from the skin at open, ragged wounds. To date, no healing has been observed of, of, of these wounds, though some clotting must be taking place for SV-42 to have not bled out. SV-42 exhibits a listless demeanor and ha has been unresponsive to any attempt by skilled handlers to incite activity. If allowed to do so, SV-42 will lay down on the ground, immobile, not moving to eat, drink, or relieve itself. Pain response conditioning has proved somewhat uh, effective in getting SV-42 to rise so that it can be cleaned. Eventually, it will attempt to lay down again no matter the strength of the shock administered, even to the point of losing consciousness. Researchers are divided as to SV-42's level of intelligence. While some believe that it is simply an animal and no smarter than others of its genius, others have come to believe that it may in fact be sapient. It has been shown on to make eye contact with persons entering Pack 12. Most of them describe its look looks as pleading. SV-42 has been involved in accidents on multiple occasions where it has been injured on pieces of equipment or its enclosure. With those ivory for intelligence believed to have been unintentionally caused by I, I SCP-482. Addendum. A request was re was submitted by Dr. Hanther to, to transport SCP-482 to Bio Research Area 4 on blank, which was approved by O55. Dr. Panther altered transportation documents to indicate that SCP-482 was to be airlifted rather than transported by armed convoy. During transit, Dr. Panther overpowered the pilot of the transport aircraft and took the controls, plunging the craft into a steep dive. Passengers and cargo experienced nearly a minute of waste before security personnel regained control of the aircraft and leveled off. As Dr. Panther was being bound and the plane landed, SV-42 broke free of containment and kicked loose security personnel to death in the cargo area. Cargo-based security footage shows it was that after this point, SV-42 approached Dr. Panther and touched met as all to its to his face. Dr. Panther exhibited signs of euphoria and con while contact was maintained. But when additional security personnel was subdued, SV-42 was tranquilizing her darts and contact was broken. He collapsed in a catatonic state from which he did not recover. After hearing concerning his, his actions, Dr. Panther was euthanized while under foundation medical care. Now we move on to SCP-43, The Beetle. <sighs> Item number, SCP-43, Object Class Safe. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-43 requires no special containment, although it is this program that SV-43 not be used for purposes other than testing. A turntable is to be maintained in the same room to, for a testing. SV-43 appears to be a vinyl copy of the White Album by the Beatles. However, upon closer expression, the record has no grooves. In spite of this, the record will play from start to finish regardless of the sorry position of the needle. When the 29th track is reached, instead of playing Revolution 9, the disc stops spinning and a faint breathing can be heard. Here the entity responds for the breathing will speak in a male voice. The entity will respond to questions and shows a profound encyclopedic knowledge of the music industry, music theory, and obscure trivia about many bands and artists. However, the entity refuses to answer questions regarding the Beatles or its own personal details. Inside the jacket, a handwritten note was found reading, Limited Edition, 1 out of 1. Thanks, John. We aren't reading that because that's a whole ass SCP article and we only have time for 5. Hello, young lady, what brings you here? 
Emma narrowed her eyes at the man before her. The old man he had to be in his eighties. He sat at a weathered metal desk with a dusty, barely he touched old laptop. I mean, desktop. It still used a CRT e screen, even. Really now, young lady, I have regret to be here just like you. You're lucky you're so ancient. You probably didn't oh, know better. Oh, I'd rather make a good impression anyway. She smiled and responded. I'm junior uh, researcher Emma Stark, and you are? Anderson. Roger Anderson. Welcome to the salt mines. Long term archives was, in fact, a former salt mine. The board out crystalline and walls served to maintain clean air with low humidity. Perfect for document storage. The irregular texture of the walls made for a soothing counterbalance to the anti aseptic straightness of the walls in the rest of the facility. Thanks. I'm looking for a file that didn't make it into the 2003 database upgrade. I'm pretty sure it's still just in paper. Yes, here's where it'll be. Do you have a file number? A destination. It should be SCP 1969 EX. Roger narrowed his eyes, a ripe a grin, and twisted across his frown. Interesting choice. Business or pleasure? Emma blinked and looked at Roger with a start. What? Business? You get requests for otherwise down here? Roger leered slightly. On occasion, we're strictly business down here, but the story of Paul's death always piques interest. Yes, but McCartney didn't die. He's still alive. Mm-hmm. But back then, it didn't seem so cut and dried as all that. But yes, he's conclusively alive, and that's why the SCP is explained. You're right. It never got into the database when it was concluded that nothing happened. They stamped and closed the file, and no one bothered to upload it and take up space, pretending it was an anomaly. He didn't even look at his computer or files. Aisle 22, box 431, four rows to the right. Show your credentials at Dart, and we've got the cameras down there, so don't go snooping in other boxes. And don't forget your latex gloves. Emma waved her badge in front of the door panel, a green light flickered, and Roger pressed the button under his desk. The door opened, Emma entered and oriented herself, then crested a white ceiling strung with fluorescent lights given oddly inadequate glows and metal frame shelves and cardboard boxes stacked in endless rows. This is... This isn't about... Hmm. I think it explains more of the story behind the SCP. Anyway. Given an oddly inadequate glow to the metal frame shelves and cardboard boxes stacked in endless rows in the cavern, the air was pure mineral dry. She carefully followed his instructions, walked into the aisle, pulled the hobby box from its shelf, she placed it on the floor and opened it. Inside there was a full set of vinyl records from the Beatles in their original sleeves. Multiples. The sleeves were marked up with a series of lines, notes, and questions about the meaning of each element of the artwork. Other albums before 1968 showed only a few notes or marks and were signed by the Cagno Ohis the Cognito Hazard and Monitoring Division. But the albums were repeated chronologically, and each month more and more lines were made. More connections were noted. Sections of the album covers were highlighted, then covered with the stickers labeled Warning, Mimetic Hazard. The frenzy of notes, connections, and redactions over the same identical covers continued until February 1970 when everything just stopped. Talk toward the in back of the box, she found the main file documentation for SCP-1969 and X. X means explained, by the way. 
Item number, SV-1969X. Object class, Euclid, no. Keter, no. Explained. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-1969 is contained in a standard humanoid containment cell at site 03E063. It is constantly monitored by cameras behind two-way glass, as SCP-1969 has displayed no dangerous anomalous behavior. Standard Containment Procedures are considered fit sufficient. SV-1969 is allowed machines and decorations for extra comfort for continuing good behavior. Any changes or shifts in appearance are to be immediately logged and reported to fight a director or one of them. Strike a through. No longer uh, applicable. Update. November 9th, 1969. SP-1969 is uncontained threads, unchecked in public. MTF Gamma 5 red herrings is to track down all vectors of misinformation spread by night vectors and intercept all flyers, pamphlets, journalistic articles that carry SP-1969 infection. All seven of those are carrying 1969 infections that have been infiltrated and disrupted. Articles discussing the truth regarding public right names continued vitality are replaced in all periodicals. Update March 14, 1970. SV 1969 is, uh, is no longer considered anomalous and no longer requires containment. All efforts to contain SV 1969 are to cease, and SV 1969 is now considered explained. Description SV 1969 is a 28 year old Scottish Canadian by the name of William Campbell. Through an undetermined regimen of training and meditation, it has, has managed to take on a perfect semblance of Person of Interest 1841-12, also known as Paul McCartney, for former or in the Beatles. SV-1969 still maintains minor differences from um, Paul, all, namely a small surgical scar on his upper lip and right-handedness, while Paul is left-handed. And yes, I'm just going to call it on Paul from now on. SCP-1969 completed his anomalous transformation at the Beatles' request to replace Paul after his death the morning of, of November 9, 1966. The remaining members of the band and their manager acting to keep news of the death from spreading wrapped the police involved with Paul's fatal automobile accidents and hired SCP in 1969. Seafield agent, yeah, Seafield incident 1841N MTF Beta 6 reporting for a witness report. Surveillance personnel noted that despite the fatal accidents, Paul was seen in as continuing to perform in concert and attend recording sessions at Abbey Road but the studios. The nature of the anomaly was not determined until 1969 came to the Foundation's attention through the Cognito Hazard Marching Division. The Beatles had already come under higher scrutiny with the simultaneous worldwide loop release on, on June 1st, 1967 of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, which while only scoring three on the cancer L non-anomalous memetic itself, had a number of symbols and subliminal hints questioning Paul Let's continue life. The CMD further discovered a hidden phone number on the Magical Mystery Tour soundtrack album cover. Released 27th November 1967. The transcript of the phone call follows. Participants Field Agent Roger Ederson and Paul, identified by voice to be a late woman in her late. A woman in her late twenties with a le West London. Oh wait, no, that's not Paul. Um, Poi, identified by a voice to be a woman in her late twenties with a West London accent. Begin log. Hello, hello. To whom am I speaking? This is about Paul. Have you received a lot of phone calls, ma'am? I haven't received a lot of phone calls. Listen, 
I've had to deal with every single pampered stone kid in every university in this country, along with every newsboy hoping for some scoop, and even honorary policemen from various districts casually wondering if I know anything about Paul. Is he dead? How did it happen? I swear, the morbid fascination and yanks things I have for or, or the demise of a man who's walking around this very minute would be farcical. If it weren't so grotesque, I'll say the same thing to you as I've said to everyone else. No, he's not dead. If he were, I should know something about it. Now please, do me the kind favor of leaving me alone. Sorry to bother you, ma'am. Have a good day. No, wait. You don't sound a university. I'm sorry, perhaps I'm being rash. Are you a journalist? Are you with the government? No, ma'am. And you can keep a secret, can you? My business is in keeping secrets. Oh god, I just... I can't just hold it in any longer. Hold what in? I... I killed him. You killed Paul McCartney? I didn't mean to. Oh god, I barely remember it all. I was so drunk and high at the same time. Everything feels so unreal. But I was there. I watched him die. I was out walking five in the morning, trying to get home after climbing too high. I could barely keep straight. I must have stepped into traffic a half dozen times. Then this man, the cute man, drives up beside me, offers me a lift. I was in no condition to refuse. I joined him. I told him where I lived. We started talking. I asked him why he's driving, what he's doing, driving around at this hour. And he talks about how he had a row with his bandmates during a recording session. That's when I realized it. He was Paul. The Paul. Paul see me and picked me up and was taking me home. Such a gentleman. <laughs> Lucky. Don't you dare say that. When I realized I was in a call or with Paul, I... The Beatles are like gods to me. And here, Paul... Dear, lovely Paul, had taken notice of me, picked me up, was my white knight. I, I lost control. I started screaming and flailing about in excitement. In my altered state, I grabbed for him, tried to hug him, kiss him, and then he... We veered off the road and clanged with a lamppost and flipped. The police were right there and had pawed me from the wreckage. They set about to freeing Paul when the car exploded. He would still be alive if it weren't for me. I... I'm sorry. Did the police speak to you further? I told them my name. Rita. They dropped me off at home and gave me some pills to swallow to over up. Courageous thing. The uniforms didn't look like any police I knew. There was this whole three arrow thing and they kept talking about amnestics. But you still remember everything? The pills didn't make you feel hazy? Did they have a coffee aftertaste? Ask Alice when and she's ten feet tall. I'm not sure what at all I was on that night. That's different. That's what I thought, but I didn't, I didn't say anything to anyone before. I was pretty much, much hit until I received a phone call about a month later. It was John, and they asked me to come down to Abbey Road. What about? I wasn't sure, but when John calls, you answer. I feared the worst. I killed Paul, after all. I would have let them do anything to me. I deserved it, but when I got there, he, George, and Ringo greeted me with hugs. They told me not to worry. All is forgiven. Everything was going to be alright. But how could it? I killed Paul, my idol, the beloved of millions. He was gone. But that's when they introduced me to William. William? William Campbell, a Canadian bloke. Sandy brown, wavy hair, white set gray eyes. John told me he was going to be the new Paul. They held look-alike contests and he won. I can't believe it. This man was nothing like Paul. Then John said they, they all had a song for me. 
I told him no, but I did was horrible. They should kill me where I stood. But no, they insisted, and William Sawyer would sing this song to me. It's on Sgt. Pepper. Lovely Rita. I still can't believe they wrote it. But the strangest thing was that as William sang, his voice changed. His skin tone, eyes, face, body, even his hair color, everything shifted. By the end of the song, he wasn't William anymore. Shifted? How? Not William? He was Paul. I could have sworn I was Paul all over again. The man whose music I loved. The man who rescued me. Gave his life for me that night. He stood before me anew. How? Paul, sorry, William, said that he completed the transformation through meditation. John said they had tried a few other experiments. Dry cardboard cut out for what? Uh, but they ne really needed a living in flesh and blood call to, uh, to confuse these things, so they found William. A cardboard cut it out? That's certainly a really good cardboard cutout, but now they have William. Alright. They swore the army to secrecy until later, when they could break the news to the fans. They feared mass suicides. Couldn't let that happen. Need something quieter. Oh god, I've been living with this massive burden of guilt ever since. Thank you. Thank you for listening. It's been an honor. But you know, for all the drama, I suppose it had to happen somehow. I don't know. Oh, it's rain or it's karma or whatever. After all, John said that they'd say they were bigger than Jesus. Or probably than Jesus, yes. Right, and for all the music, still... Only three died on the mount that day. Wait, what? Phone disconnects. End log. The phone call was traced to a management office in an abandoned feed lot outside I learned in Wyoming. No sign of Rita or a working telephone was found. The present instance of Paul believed to be Mr. Campbell was given the designation of SCP 1969. MTF-806 took custody of SCP-1969 as we accounts for observation. Addendum November 9th, 1969 Despite Foundation custody of 1969, the Beatles continued to release music. MTF-806 note the continued presence of uh, Paul at recording sessions. Furthermore, SCP-1969 researchers notes note that the author does not re resemble Oh, Paul. Enhanced testing and interviews confirmed that Mr. Campbell is not anomalous. He is to be amnesics and release. MTF Beta 6 increases the virulence of Paul McCartney and confirms that he is still alive. Incognito Hazard Monitoring Division reports that a Beatles album um, um, carries others carry an increasingly virulent mimetic hazard. Upon review, the CMD hereby revises the a he can't the red score to seven. Viewing the albums and discussion with other curious individuals lead to the conclusion that at Paul McCartney was killed on November 9th, 1966. While it can be demonstrated that at Paul McCartney continues to live, given the widespread worldwide distribution of Beatles albums covers, 1969 is to be expanded to include this mimetic hazard, and its object class is red. It does a header. Nineteen sixty nine is an active widespread mimetic hazard of pandemic proportions. MTF Gamma Five Red Herons formed to dispense the truth regarding the success of Paul worldwide. Field agents are embedded on college campuses to attend meetings and informal discussions regarding in the alleged death of Paul McCartney and disseminate the truth and present skepticism. MTF Beta Six were of an unexpected update of suicides due to SCP-1841. This has been struck through. Addendum, March 14th, 1970. MTF Gamma 5 reports high level success in combating SCP-1969. A photo spread in Life magazine showing the continuing life of 
of Paul McCartney has as a very complete inoculation to the mimetic hazard. The ease of removal of the hazard indicates that it's non anomalous in nature and could be attributed to mass hysteria not stemming from nineteen eighty for not stemming from eighteen forty one. SV 1969 is considered explained. Emma looked up from her reading. Something wasn't right. She pulled out the document, closed the box, placed it on the shelf, and jogged back out to the reception room. She tossed the papers on Roger's desk. You're Roger Anderson. You're supposed to shelf the file when you're done with it. Emma slammed um, the hand down on the papers. You're Roger Anderson, and I'm not done with this file. Roger shook his head and allowed himself a sheepish smirk. I am. I was incognito at the time. I worked on 1969. Hey, I've got to ask in the, in the excitement of you looking at my work. Record, which object are you assigned to? How did you start looking for 1969? <sighs> Hang on. Emma stared at War Roger for a minute. Is he trying to change his subject? No. More about 1969, I can still ask. I'm on SCP-12. I was... Oh, for the love of 12, it's always 12. Roger buried his face in his hands. 12 is the reason I transferred to Kaga's in the first place. Lost a partner and good and a good friend to twelve. Emma peered into Roger's craggy face. You're Anderson. Anderson and Splitter Anderson. Roger nodded. Leon Splitzer, damn fine partner, drinking buddy, confidant, all stripped away in a paranoid mess by a dang piece of cheap music. I was popping amnestics like TikToks when I realized what was going on. I never actually saw the villain with the mud off, but one tip, miss, don't abuse amnestics ever. Resolved to be regaled with rambling. Old man tells you corrected. Amnestics? Amnestics, amnesiacs, whatever. I know they reformulated them a few years back and reminded everyone that they're called amnestics, but we were all used to calling them amnesiacs, even if it wasn't right. By panic, I realized what was happening to Leon. We were in Florence to pick up a copy of 701, which is safe to look at and read, so we weren't expecting something as insidious as 12. When I realized that 12 had changed Leon, I started recording everything I knew and made myself an amnestic cocktail. I lost my best friend and half of my childhood that day. Do you know how horrible it feels to go visit your family for Christmas and realize you can't remember your mother's name? Terrible. When I got back, I put it in for transfers to Cogaz. I wasn't going to let another 12 slip past me again. I also got medical orders never to take amnestics again. Emma wondered, but when you retire... Roger shuddered down with a wave of his hand. I ain't retiring. I had to give up that possibility just to avoid the retirement party drink. That's why I'm down here in archives now. I'm too run down for anything actually anomalous, so I, I get to sit down here in the saw at Romanets most days. It's good for my lungs. Slow pace, low risk, best retirement I could ask for. Silence passed between them. Roger sat contently while Emma leaned against the desk, half sitting on it. She scrummed and looked around, noticing the papers under her hand. Now about Paul, 
You still haven't answered why you wanted to look up 1969. Don't think I've forgotten. I am old, but not senile, Miss Stark. Roger interrupted with a wink. Emma rolled her eyes and sighed. Okay, so I was looking over K.M. Sand and of all str or no, for clues about what a 12 was doing. I didn't see anything, but there was this note about how you alluded to Paul's death on the night it was supposed to happen. So I looked for any records we might have on Paul's death and learned about SCP-1969-X, so here I am. Roger's eyes tried in response. Sandoval talked about McCartney's death and he was supposed to have died while we were in Florence? Emma pulled out her tablet and presented it to him. I took a picture. See the note in Martin and regarding McCartney? Roger poured over the tablet, pulled his, his desk lamp close over it. Cursing, cursing the clashing lights, pushed it away and read carefully, mumbling to himself. Looks like Wardham's writing. He knew more about 1969 than any of us. If anyone knew the particulars of McCartney's death, it was him. But if this really is his journal, you're right. Sandoval was talking about when McCartney died. That's why Graham entered and, and Golgotha. But according to this, he hadn't even found 12 yet. How could he have known that Paul died that night, a thousand miles away? Emma looked askance at Roger. Paul didn't die that night. Roger gave Emma a blank stare. No, Paul didn't die that night. Emma left leaped back into her questions. But that's the problem with this documentation. If Paul never died, who was William Campbell? Why did you pick him up? What was that phone call with Rita all about? None of this makes any sense. Roger smiled and spread his hands placatedly. Roger explained to me. Mass hysteria interference from another SCP. 1841? Sounds about right to me. Strange, it was apparently neutralized back in the 19th century though. I remember reading it over then. That doesn't make sense. I just went to... I just listened to... A word them and went ahead with it. You don't contradict the site director. Emma tapped a few figures in her tablet. No, it's not 1841. That's a travel guide or something. Can't be. It had to do with mass... Mass hysteria uh, carried by friends... At least, I remember correctly, died with them. Well, 969 got reused. How about, aha, here it is. 1841X, your 1841's explained in the database. Explained? When did that happen? Read it to me. Emma looked at... Roger in disbelief from his request, but she shook her head and went through the record with him, including the ad ad addenda. So for a moment, and she moves, this doesn't help the ca this case a bit. So where did put a full rise on this article? What do you mean? You know how the stuff is redacted or expunged or behind an access code when you're when we're not supposed to know about it, right? Well, that little redacted sign lets us know that something is in fact here. We're there, we're just not supposed to see it, but sometimes someone pulls strings and makes sure we aren't allowed to know what that they're saying information. What do those dead does say? It tells us that they completely changed your article, made it look complete, that way we it, it walk away thinking that it's neutralized last century when it's still active. I'm more concerned that if 1841 is explained, then 1969 can't be mass hysteria. Suddenly, it's not explained. Roger hardened his jaw and swallowed. So Paul really did die. Emma jumped up and, and paced. No, we know he didn't die. The only way this makes sense is if we know he, he died. Then no... Oh, he didn't die. Which is it? <laughs> Maybe both. What? Listen, as far as the rest of the world is concerned, 
Paul never died. Everyone in a little crazy one, Paul, saw stuff that wasn't there, and then we all wised up. But the base 6 involvement, Campbell and Rio call, none of that would have gone down that way if we didn't have conclusive knowledge that Paul did die on November 9th, 1966. So maybe he was dead, and now he isn't. Stranger things have happened, you know. Emma stopped pacing and leaned forward against the desk, a knot started forming in her stomach. What are we talking about, resurrection? They were bigger than Jesus, right? More popular than Jesus, Roger corrected, realization and passed over his face. Oh, oh, Rita, listen, have you got the 12 documentation? Show me the full record. I'm so well, clear for it. Now I'm amnesiacs, remember? Emma passed her tablet to Roger. He squinted to read the screen, but got through the short documentation quickly. Where's the rest of it? That's it. No, this is all kinds of inaccurate. Really? Emma took the tablet back and looked it over again. I know I've been wanting to update with some of the most recent results, but... You're still suspending it from the ceiling on it in its own room so people can't look at it, right? Yes. The way that it is reads, it's not the Euclid. It's safe. You stick it in a locker and forget about it. You don't go through all the trouble of its own room and leave it where someone has any chance to see it at some good angle. The knot tightened further in her stomach. She felt her insides grow cold. Roger continued, And how many pages is the music now? We had five when I stopped working on it. How many now? Um, we, uh... 117. 117? All in blood, even when an ink is provided? And then, like where this was going. Getting words out was getting harder. Yes. And do all the pages carry the cognate? I guess? Emma blushed and shrunk. N no, just ten of them. Don't you think this is all important documentation? Yes, sir. And what's this about a recent storm? Did the 1966 Florence flood seem recent to you, or just a storm? Emma was at the verge of tears. No. Miss Stark, this documentation is inaccurate and misleading. In a small voice, she responded, I'll fix it. I want to fix it. Roger stopped, realizing what he was doing. He swallowed and took a deep breath. Damn you, Twelve. He softened his tongue. No, it's not your fault. What I'm saying is that Twelve is receiving the full Oreza, just like... Ike, 1841. Emma's encroaching dread dissolved. What? Are you sure? Roger fixed Emma with a steely gaze. Yes, read the journal again. Sandoval was affected and had to find 12 before he knew about it. You know you, you can't just stick it in a lock. Or, you know it's Euclid. Emma, confused, replied, Can we put it in a locker? For a bit, but people know about it. And when they know about it, they, they want to do more with it. They pull it back out. You ready to change things and say more about it? Heck, I was almost shouting at you just now. How many people have read that? How many have loved it? Does it deserve that love? Does that document deserve so much attention? And how I many want nothing more than to re re rewrite it? They know how to fix it. They know how to complete it. And yet they cannot. Emma's eyes, eyes widen. Oh my god, is that why we keep testing it? Is that why we can't put it away? We're all affected by it? We, we want to display it? 
Roger nodded. I bet so. It's not a strong effect. It can be resisted, but it's alluring. It's sexy. Even when I present with some crappy and accurate documentation, something about it sings your, in your soul. You just know how powerful it is. How compelling. You want to work with it. That's why it's Euclid. And someone doesn't want anyone to know this. I'm sorry, wondering. She's been what, working with this for nearly a year now. Who is hiding the truth from her? From the Foundation? Who is trying to make sure no one knows more, anything more about it? Why? What is this scrap of music capable of? Rhythm? Rhythm's dead. No, it's got uh, to be someone else. Then who? No clue. But you need a chance to meet with some other old timers. Someone's got to know something. And 12 being 12, someone's just dying to spell his gills. That's about it. I got an invite to Dr. Califano's retirement party next week. Come with me. We'll get some answers. It must rain. Okay, yes. I gotta get back to work. But what about 1969 and all that? It's a crapshoot, but I'm betting on 12. My question is... What does any of this have to do with SCP-43? Oh well. We're going to SV-44. World War II era molecular molecular fission in canon. I guess it's kind of a new canon? That's interesting. I have number SCP-44, object class safe. Special containment procedures, a constant stream of hydrogen ions and unbound oxygen items and other trace-free radicals emanate from the, the muscle of SCP-44 at all times. Because this is, vacuum of SCP-44 are to be well ventilated to keep dangerous gases and moisture from accumulating. Muscle oak coverings are to be fitted at all times to keep birds and, and small animals from investigating the large open barrel of SCP-44. Hmm. Addendum. As SCP-44 has not been involved in any significant instance in the blank years it has been held by the Foundation, SCP-44 has been reclassified as safe. Must I really define significant incidents? A contained procedure and standard safety protocols are followed. But 44 appears to be no more or dangerous than any other or big a gun. No, the variance does not count. This is from someone on the O5 Council. Not, not sure which number. Description: SCP-44 is a howl howitzer. Secretly manufactured in the late stages of the Second World War by. If we're talking about World War II, that's technically the third. The First World War was the one that was fought by France and England over the Americas. Anyway, in the late stages of the Third World War by Aircraft Engineers, personally supervised by Albert Speer, German Minister of Arm Armaments. And war production under Adolf Hitler. SV-44 is not unique. is unique not only because of its size, 251,000 kilograms or 251 uh, metric tons, but also because it fires unconventional artillery using an atypical delivery method. Rather than having a breech or loading shells, the rear of the barrel is configured into a massive air compression chamber. Any object or pile of objects that fits may be loaded into SV-44's muzzle to be used as ammunition. Because of its size, SV-44 must, must remain rail mounted and requires two freight locomotives to move. Researchers believe that SV-44 weakens molecular and atomic bonds in any material loading in its muzzle. However, the methods by which 
SP44 affects molecular bonds is not known, due primarily to the numerous complex mechanisms that compose the housing and workings of SCP-44. In fact, some mechanisms appear useless and seem to do nothing other than spin or make noise, even when SCP-44 is not supplied with power. Both equipment and personnel have been lost while working while exploring the inside of SCP-44's barrel. When SCP-44 is fired, all matter within its barrel is ejected at a high speed it has a glowing red slug proportionate to size to the amount of mass loaded into the muscle. Upon unstriking a solid object or the ground, the slug explodes with the yield of the proportionate to the mass of the great combination at no less than a blank percent mass energy conversion rate. The yield will also increase somewhat the longer the slug remains in the barrel. The greatest known yield was achieved when the administrator's 8,900 kilogram personal oh, diesel pickup truck was located in its entirety in the muzzle of SV44 and fired in the pictured experiment. I mean, okay. So it's a big gun that it has some really high destructive capabilities. Anyway, we are moving on to SCP-45 Atmospheric Converter. Item number SCP-45 Object Class Safe. Dang, like everything's been safe today. Special Containment Procedures. SV-45 is to be kept affixed to an examination platform in a hemispherical chamber measuring 5 meters in radius at Oceanographic Research Station 12. Located at blank on the sea floor of the Pacific Ocean, the chamber is to be kept filled with gaseous neon at equilibrium and pressure with its surrounding environment. The chamber is separated from um, habitable portions of the station by 5 meters of local seawater, and all interactions with SG-45 are to be performed via a telepresent or robotic means. The bindings that attach SG-45 to its platform are fitted with quick-release latches, which are to be released when necessary to prevent a container breach. Given the seismic activity associated with SCP-45, if the containment chamber is damaged or breached by seismological activity, SCP-45 should be recovered by remotely controlled or drone vehicles and kept at least 10 meters from human inhabited spaces, until such time as compares can be completed to the op optimal containment chamber. SCP-45 is an, an eco-osahedron eco composed of ice. It's 12. A metastate of form of water ice that is typically formed within a narrow range of high pressure and temperatures. Heavily occluded with a near fractures in a regular a complex pattern. SV45 has an average radius of 1.7 meters and density of 2.6 grams per centimeter squared which is approximately twice that of non-anomalous as I swear of I didn't understand a single word of that. SV-45 remains in a stable state at a temperature ranging from approximately 273 degrees Celsius to 227 degrees Celsius. Oh, wait, negative 273 degrees Celsius, sorry. And pressuring ranging from 0.4 or, or pascals to 3 giga pascals. Although it is possible to melt or vaporize SP45 at temperatures and pressures outside of these ranges, the H2O in involved is attracted to itself by unknown means and will remain very close of its proximity unless forcibly separated. The water will free freeze as soon as conditions return to a position inside SV45 stable range. 
Then any sub portions kept separate prior to refreezing will freeze into smaller or icosahedrons identical in form and properties to the total amount of SCP-345. Based on the available evidence, it is currently believed that SV-45 is a three-dimensional projection of a hyper sahedron A regular polyhedron that exists in four spatial dimensions and has 600 tetrahedral facets. So I'm guessing 600 faces and the fourth of them are in a whole other dimension. This is getting really confusing. Research is ongoing to determine how SV-45 is able to maintain a stable lower dimensional projection, whether this can be and whether this can be adapted for use when interacting with other dimensionally anomalous SCP items. At unpredictable intervals in ranging from two weeks to three months, SV-45 will spontaneously rotate around multiple axes and simultaneously for a period no longer than 73 seconds. During this period, a series of small seismic events, 2.5 on the Richter scale, will occur in the immediate area of SCP-45. If SCP-45 is prevented from rotating, the seismic events will increase in strength logarithmically to a maximum of 5.3 on the Richter scale. Following the end of the rotation period, the radius of SV-45's effect will temporarily double for the same amount of time that it rotated. When gaseous is nitrogen or argon, nitrogen composes approximately 78% of the Earth's atmosphere by volume, argon composes approximately 0.93% of the Earth's atmosphere by volume. Come with an and 3.7 meters of any portion of SV-45, they're replaced by different compounds. Nitrogen in 2 is replaced by liquid at water at a conversion rate of 1.1 1 .1 molecule of nitrogen is made into almost two molecules of water and AR or argon is replaced by crystalline is replaced by table salt at a conversion rate of one molecule of argon is replaced by four molecules of salt. SV-45 was discovered in 1972 when a foundation submarine in scanning the Pacific abyssal plane for suitable locations for undersea bases was averted into the investigate the epicenter of a, a series of unexpected localized strong tremors. SV-45 was found lodged in a crevice which had apparently prevented it from rotating. Removed from the crevice, it was brought towards the vessel for further study. Upon coming within range of the interior, the atmosphere exhibited its anomalous effects. This resulted in a catastrophic breach of internal containment protocols and the loss of 12 commute room members. Prior to SV-45 being released and the submarine moving out of range. After addendum, following several years of testing, it was accidentally discovered that SV-45 also converts hydrogen gas into random a mixture of simple Omega acids at a rate of one molecule of hydrogen becomes 0 0.04 molecules of, of amino acids. However, this conversion only occurs when the gas is diffused in saline water, such as that produced by SCP-45. Analysis of the seafloor surrounding the location where SCP-45 was discovered has revealed a large community of microfauna and microflora that is approximately three times as diverse as would be expected given the geography and location. All that biochemistry wherein the amino acids produced by SV45 are statistically over abundant as compared to the microbiotic uh, uh, from some similar geologic regions. Additionally, all three are produced in pure salt water, devoid of other organic materials.
this has been SCP. <laughs> this has been a long one. This has been SCP 41, 42, 43, 44, and 45. As well as a random document that seems to have nothing to do with the SCP it was linked from. Well, two actually, but I didn't read the other one because it was a wholly different SCP. Anyway, I hope you all enjoyed this video. Please come back. Wait. I hope you all enjoyed this video. Please leave a like, comment, and subscribe. And if you have any questions, please leave them down in the comments. I want to do a Q&A for you as soon as possible. Goodbye.